Hey guys, welcome to a new video. And well, as the title and thumbnail suggested, today we're going to continue with the DIY backup server video series. It's been dragging along a little bit, but I really want to get this done. So let's get started. In this part of the video, and I'm kind of cutting it up in little parts, we're going to install uh, Minio. And Minio is an S3 storage server. So on top of having our hardware, which we've discussed before, and then running Proxmox on there as the opening system, just because I like that distribution and it has everything I need to run some VMs, but especially ZFS built in, which is our file system. On top of that, we're going to run another storage software called Minio. Now I've started using Minio many years back, and since then it's changed a lot. So we're going to run through a few changes about how I set it up in, I believe, 2017 versus now, because Minio really went through a lot of changes. But in the end, the base of the software itself it's basically the same. And what it does, it makes your storage, which we have in the form of ZFS, available as an S3 bucket. So exactly like Amazon or other cloud vendors are doing in their way with their own protocols, S3 is a protocol to uh, define an access storage. Now you can ask why not you know, we already have ZFS. Why are you using S3? Well, I kind of see ZFS as the underlying layer. So it does my redundancy, security, or well, the operating system does security, but it does a bit of compression. And, uh, uh, well, in my case, mostly ZFS is used as the RAID card controller. So it does my redundancy by running a RAID Z2 on five times 10 terabytes. That's been running since 2017. So that's still fine. Zero disks have failed of the Seagate iRemove series. So that's great. And uh, another thing it provides me is being able to make separate data sets and then giving a quota to those data sets. Because the whole setup is built as a multi-tenant setup. So I can have multiple people using the same server basically and the same storage to share costs but then you kind of want to dedicate space to one or the other and we do that using quotas in zfs now you can argue that minio since before now also can do redundancy features using erasure coding and it also has built-in quota and stuff like that but because i really want to build client independent um is segregated environments that they can use. I like doing it on the back end using ZFS. So there's multiple ways to do it. I do it this way. Now, the first step in our video today is that we're going to add a user called Minio. This user will be used to run the Minio process. And so all directories and the executable will be uh, set to that user only because no other user really needs to access that data. We do this by simply using a add user command, filling in the details, and that's it. Right, now that we have our Minio user, let's first create a data set within the HDD mirror ZFS pool. Uh, instead of a directory, a data set is a ZFS directory or partition, you could almost call it, which you can give special um, things like quotas and other uh, attributes. So let's first create the Minio dataset and then let's create the Minio slash Quindor dataset because I will be a tenant of, you know, my backup solution. Once that's done, I'll quickly show you how to set a quota of 100 gigabyte on the Quindor dataset directory. And then we're going to change the permissions of all the file systems and data sets below the Minio to the Minio user. Okay, 
Now we have the storage part set up. Let's go to the opt directory, which I generally like to use to install my programs on Linux. Let's create a Minio directory, and then let's give only the Minio user permissions to that directory. Okay, let's go into the directory and then assume the user role of Minio. So basically we become the Minio user. Then we get the Minio binary. Um, I'll have that linked down in the video description or the accompanying article once that's up. And uh, once the uh, download is complete using wget, we have to make the uh, executable actually executable. So we do a chmod plus x on the Minio uh, downloaded file, which then becomes executable. Next, to try out Minio, let's start it using a default starting line. Again, this will be in the description and in the linked article, which will just start Minio on the default ports with the default options, just to see if it's working. Okay, it gives us a URL we can connect to. And once we do so using a browser, in this case, I'm using Chrome, uh, we can log in with Minio admin and the password's just password, basically the same as we just set in that starting line. And well, here we are in the web interface of Minio, and we can create a bucket, as it's called, which will then be our receiving end for our backups. Now, each tenant in the, uh, the way we're setting it up will have its own Minio instance. So they'll have the management URL and the API URL. Now, they are the same URL, except for the different port they connect to. The advantage this is, is that if someone wants to segregate their backups, like uh, they want to create a bucket per client, or they want to make a bucket for like, uh, for instance, I have a bucket for my video archive, and then I have a bucket for my desktop backups, and then I have a backup for my mail backups and things like that. Now, sometimes you want to combine a bucket because Restic, the backup software, which is the next video that we're going to use, uh, can actually do deduplication. So if you back up multiple desktops to the same bucket in Minio uh, or the same repository for Restic, uh, that'll deduplicate the data and thus means that less data will be stored. But that's for the next video. So uh, each tenant in my case, Quindor, will get their own Minio instance. They can change and use and create buckets and delete and whatever they want to their heart's content. They can't really influence another instance because they're running their own instance of uh, uh, Minio and those are that's completely separated in a different directory. So back to the buckets. Uh, to make a bucket, you click on buckets, you say add, and then we're going to make a bucket, bucket called desktop clients. And that's it for now. No special or other configurations needed. Now, in reality, you'd set up the Minio admin with a very hardened password. And then you'd likely create a different user, which can then write backups, but can't log into the console. So that is the user you can actually put on your backup clients so that you can leave the password there instead of having the uber password and admin everywhere. Okay, now that we know Minio starts and seems to be working correctly, let's create a startup file in etc system D to automatically start this Minio instance for Quindor once the system starts. We do that by creating a service file and in that service file, we basically have to change a few parameters. Again, everything will be linked in the description um, to make sure that it's using the correct directory and points to the correct binaries. In this case, it's all the Quindor directory and there's one environment file in there we'll be creating shortly. Each of the tenant directories will basically have this environment file in there, which has the ports that Minio will run on, the admin, user and password. As I said before, you have to make that a good, decent password and then Probably it's advisable to use a different user to actually do the backups. And um, well, that's basically what's in that file directories and things like that. So before you start that service, 
you have to create this file first and then it should start fine. Okay, with that service file created, let's load it and then start the service and then check on the status of the service. And well, that seems to be working fine. So we should be able to open that same web page again, log in and see our desktop clients and things like that. To round off this video, let's create a second tenant called Pietje and well, let's run through the whole process again. Basically, we create a new data set for Pietje. We then set the quota for Pietje. We assign the directly the correct permissions for Minio only. We then copy the environment file that for Quindor and change it for Pietje. So we change the directory and the port numbers. And then we do the same for the startup file. We basically copy the one for Quindor, change all the values for Pietje, and then we should be able to start the service for Pietje. And well, that's how you add a second user or second tenant in this case. One last thing about those quotas, as I've shown, you can set those quotas per individual tenant or you can actually create a data set with sub data sets and then set it for the parent also. So let's say I uh, don't want to fill up my complete disk. I have X amount of terabytes allocated for these backups. And then for the users below that, you can set a total amount for the parent data set. And then for the sub data sets, you can still set individual amounts. Now, how that will work in practice, you have to give it your own structure. Uh, in my case, I just want to make sure the disks doesn't don't get filled up completely. If, uh, well, multiple tenants suddenly dump a huge amount of data, so then I can still raise the quota if, if needed and, and instead of getting stuck with nothing free. Uh, so I set a top level quota on Minio and then set a quota per tenant. And well, that's it for this video. We now have a running S3 storage daemon, or multiple actually, to which we can connect remotely. And that connecting remotely is exactly what we're going to do in the next video. Hope to see you back for that. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.